Welcome everybody. So I will just lead the, the, the stage to Irais from Tesco and she will introduce this seminar. Uh, welcome everyone to the Quantum Spain seminar. For this session, we have uh, our invited speaker who is Carlos Bravo Prieto. He's a postdoctoral researcher in the James Erders Group at the Pride University, Berlin. He earned his PhD in 2022 under the supervision of Jose Ignacio La Torre at the University of Barcelona. During his PhD, he spent a few years as a researcher at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and later he contributed, uh, while well, he continued his journey as a, an associate researcher at the Technology Innovation Institute in Abu Dhabi. His research is focused mainly in quantum algorithms, quantum information, condensed matter physics, and machine learning. So let's welcome him and uh, he will talk about today exploring applications of variational quantum algorithms in linear algebra. Thank you, Carlos. You can start. Thank you. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for being here today. And also, thank you very much for the invitation to give this seminar. So, indeed, as you mentioned, uh, my name is Carlos Bravo Prieto. I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher in, at the University, at the Free University of Berlin. But not so long ago, I was a PhD student at the University of Barcelona. And actually, what I'm going to present today is some of the research that I did while I was a PhD student. And I grouped this research under the title of Exploring uh, Applications of Variational Quantum Algorithms in Linear Algebra. So we are living now the so-called noisy intermediate, uh, intermediate scale quantum era, where uh, current quantum computers have a low number of qubits from 50 qubits to a few hundreds, best case scenario in the near future. With uh, low coherence times, we can perform of the order of 1,000 operations uh, before the coherence uh, wipes out the result. And also, there's no uh, uh, quantum error correction. So for instance, by the way, can you see the pointer? Not sure you can see the yes. Yes. Okay. yes, yes. Uh, and another thing, if you have any questions, please, uh, I don't mind if you interrupt me. Okay. A seminal example of what can be done with this uh, near-term quantum computers could be, for instance, the quantum supremacy experiment, right? So this experiment tries to Im imitate somehow the boson sampling experiment, but now instead of using uh, photons, you apply random quantum circuits. The idea is that at the end, you will uh, sample from a Porter-Thomas-like distribution, which is believed to be classically hard. So as you can see, this example uh, is quite interesting, although it does not have, uh, as far as I know, any practical uh, application in real life. So we can say that these quantum computers, the one from Google, IBM, IonQ, Xanadu, and so on and so forth, are not yet capable of large scale practical quantum computation. So the question is, can we do something useful with these uh, near term quantum computers? Um, hopefully the, the answer is yes, although no one really knows, but there are some uh, promising candidates, the so-called variational quantum algorithms. These quantum algorithms do not have uh, high requisites in the number of qubits, can be implemented with shallow quantum circuits and are uh, hardware efficient in the sense that you can adapt your variational quantum algorithm to the particular architecture of the quantum computer and also you can adapt to the particular native uh, set of gates of your quantum computer. And also known to be slightly noise resilient, at least to some uh, coherent errors. Here you, you see uh, a sketch of a variational quantum algorithm. Uh, at the top you have the quantum processor unit and at the bottom the classical processor unit. So uh, we can imagine that for quantum computer, it's a machine that, prepare, that prepares quantum trial states, basically. So we are gonna apply certain unitary operations that will depend on some set of classical parameters. We are gonna measure the trial state. We are gonna do some post-processing if needed. And at the end, we are gonna compute quantum function, typically defined in terms of uh, a Hamiltonian or uh, some observables. The idea is to encode uh, the problem into this cost function. For instance, if we want to 
find the ground state of some molecule, the uh, cost function is going to be the Hamiltonian of, of this molecule. We're going to fit this cost function to a classical optimizer, to our classical processor unit. The classical uh, optimizer will deliver a new set of classical parameters. So the end, when we repeat this loop, uh, we minimize the cost function. When we reach some uh, user specified criteria, we stop the optimization. And ideally, we would obtain uh, the result of our problem. Let me mention that there are two interesting reviews that uh, treat variational quantum algorithms in uh, depth. But uh, in this presentation, I will mainly focus on, on applications. So I will present uh, three different uh, research projects that I did while I was a PhD student. The first one is the quantum singular value decomposer, which is a, quant a variational quantum algorithm uh, to uh, uh, do the singular value decomposition of a bipartite, a bipartite uh, pure state. Then I will present the variational quantum linear solver, which is a variational quantum algorithm to solve linear system of equations. And then I will uh, treat a slightly different topic uh, related to quantum generative modeling. <clears throat> so let me start with the quantum singular value decomposer. This is a project, a joint project with uh, Diego Garcia Martin and Jose Nazo La Torre and was published in 2020 in Physical Review A. So imagine that you are given uh, many copies of an unknown bipartite pure state, psi AB. Ideally, if you want to study the entanglement spectrum of this uh, state, you would like to cast it in this Smith uh, form, which is this one here, where these lambdas are the Smith eigenvalues. I here are the number of non-zero Smith eigenvalues, and Y and VI are the Smith uh, eigenvectors. However, uh, it's not trivial to cast the state in this form, right? And now by simply reading, for instance, the Smith eigenvalues, you could compute uh, this, this entanglement spectrum. So the standard procedure would be first, we would have to perform a quantum tomography to reconstruct this unknown state. Then we would have to compute the reduced density matrix by tracing one of the subsystems, right? For instance, tracing the subsystem B. After this, you would have to analyze the reduced density matrix. At the end, you have the reduced density matrix in the form. And now you could uh, read the Smith and values and compute, for instance, the Newman entropy. So you could, you could compute the entanglement spectrum of the, of the unknown quantum state. But as you can see, requires an exponential amount of uh, resources, right? By simply doing tomography and then computing the reduced density matrix and then diagonalizing it. So what we propose is a variational quantum algorithm to cast this unknown state in a pseudo Smith Smith form. So the idea is to cast the state in the Smith form, but what we are gonna do is we are gonna apply different unitaries on each of the subsystems that will depend on some classical parameters so that when acting on this unknown quantum state, we cast the state in this form here, which is not exactly the Smith form, but how we can still read the Smith eigenvalues. So how we are gonna do this? As I said, we are gonna apply two different unitaries that will depend on, on, on some set of classical parameters on each of the parties. And we are gonna force exact output incidence on both subsystems. So this is our figure of merit for the training. We are gonna try to maximize the output coincidence so that at the end, if you train it and you manage to get the optimal parameters and you always obtain exact output coincidence, we'll have the state in this form here, right? Notice that there are no quantum gates connecting the parties, therefore we have not uttered the uh, entanglement spectrum of the system. We have not modified the Smith again values. Another interesting thing here is that we are training to satisfy some particular correlations in comparison to other variational quantum algorithms where you, for instance, minimize some energy. This is slightly different. And uh, in a striking contrast to quantum tomography, here we only measure in one setting. We only measure in the computational basis. We don't, we don't do any kind of quantum tomography. 
So once you train the quantum singular body composer and you cast the state in this pseudo smith form, you can read out the spectrum. Now, by simply reading this uh, computational basis states, EI, uh, by reading the probability, by measuring the probability, you can read the Smith eigenvalues. So simply measuring the probability of the computational or the computational basis states appearing delivers the Smith eigenvalues. So here are some results for six qubit uh, bipartite pure states. Here in the y-axis, uh, I put the I plot the entropy for the quantum that delivers the quantum singular by the composer, and here in the x-axis, the exact entropy. Uh, what we do here is we increase the number of layers of our uh, variational quantum algorithm of our answer. So that as we increase the number of layers, we have uh, more classical parameters and we have better approximations to the exact uh, entropy, as you can see. And also, you can see this plot here, that as we increase the number of layers, indeed, the uh, error decreases exponentially and also the standard deviation. On the other hand, we can also recover the, the eigenvectors by simply applying this uh, Inverted unitaries, the, the unitaries that we have changed, U and B, can be inverted, applied to the computational basis states, and you can recover from these the, the eigenvectors. And not only that, but there are two uh, fun spin offs from the quantum singular valve decomposer, which are the autoencoder and the uh, long distance swap. So once we have trained our quantum singular valve decomposer, so we have exact output coincidence here. We can simply apply control node gates from one subsystem to the other. So at the end, here we are going to measure R with zero. So we have disentangled both subsystems. And at the end, we have effectively compressed uh, the quantum information in one of the subsystems. Now I can uh, give this state to someone else. And this person can apply the throw nodes, the inverted unitaries, and recover the initial quantum state. On the other hand, uh, the other spin off is the long. A distance swap, you can see that once we have trained the quantum singular body composer, so here in the step in the middle, we can communicate classically the optimal parameters, apply the inverted unitaries with the, the, the classical parameters and achieve uh, a swap. So we go from psi AB to psi BA. And this is done without any quantum gates. Uh, Acting both subsystems, but just by simply classical communication of the parameters. So let me summarize what we have seen. Uh, I presented a, a variational quantum algorithm for computing the Smith eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a bipartite state. And two of the possible spin offs of this uh, variational quantum algorithm is to perform a swap between parties without any quantum entanglement, just by classical communication. And also, we have seen that the quantum singular value composer can be used as a quantum autoencoder, so to compress quantum information. Interestingly, uh, this quantum singular value composer was already used as a subroutine to compute uh, financial market indicators in this paper here. So let me move to the second part of the talk. Uh, I'd like to present the variational quantum linear solvers. This is a joint work with uh, Ryan LaRose, Marco Cerezo, Gigi Tsubasi, Lukas uh, Sincio, and Patrick J. Coles. And we put it uh, online in archive a few years ago. So let me first define the problem that we are trying to solve. This is the linear system problem. So we are given a matrix A and a, a vector B, being A an n by, na, n by, by n matrix and B an n-dimensional vector, and we want to solve for x, right? We know that this problem has applications in many different fields, for instance, uh, machine learning, uh, partial differential equations, and even uh, for analyzing electrical circuits. Um, however, we know that best uh, classical algorithms scale polynomially with the size of this matrix A. Best case scenario, even if the matrix A is sparse, I believe the scaling is linear with the size, the size of the matrix, matrix. So our best hope here is to uh, find a quantum algorithm that provides some kind of speed up for solving these kind of problems. I'm sure there is a quantum algorithm that solves this problem with an speed up. This is the 
Harrow Hazardin uh, Lloyd algorithm, HHL in short. However, this algorithm tries to solve a slightly different problem, the so-called quantum linear system problem. So now, instead of having critical vector X and B, you're gonna have quantum uh, states X and B. And the goal of this, uh, quantum, uh, of this quantum algorithm is to prepare X such that X is proportional to our classical uh, solution. Uh, interestingly, this uh, quantum algorithm scales logarithmically with the size of the matrix N. So it provides a, a, an exponential speed up compared to classical algorithms. And further improvements have been uh, seen lately that reduce the complexity of the algorithm with the condition number kappa. In the condition number, the ratio between the maximum and lowest eigenvalue of the matrix A and the error epsilon. What is the problem with this uh, quantum algorithm? That it requires deep uh, quantum circuits. So this is why we propose the variational quantum linear solver, which is a variational quantum algorithm geared gear towards uh, applying these these two NIC, NIC devices. Okay, so what do we need? Uh, to, to build this variational quantum algorithm. First, we need, we need to define a faithful cost function, right? So we want to define a cost function so, such that if the value of this cost function is zero, then it means that you have solved the linear system. Ideally, we would like also to have uh, solution guarantees. So can we guarantee that the solution is below some uh, fresh call, some error epsilon? This would be great to have. And then obviously we will need to find quantum circuits to compute this cost function. Here is the sketch of the full uh, uh, variational quantum linear solver, but let me go step by step in every of the parts. So the first part is the input. Here we have to specify the linear problem. We will have to uh, define uh, uh, the quantum state B and the matrix A, right? We do have some assumptions in our variational quantum algorithm, as in any other uh, quantum algorithm for solving linear system of equations. The first one is that exists an efficient circuit U such that acting on zero, uh, you create the quantum state B. This is an, a standard assumption in uh, in uh, quantum algorithms for solving linear system of equations. Another assumption that you may not, not, not like, but it is what it is, especially if you try to, to uh, gear this problem towards NISI devices, is that uh, we assume that A is given by a linear combination of unitaries of this type here. And obviously, we assume that the norm of A is, under, is, is uh, less than one, and the condition number is less than infinity. So the, the linear system has a, a particular solution. Uh, for the optimization loop, indeed the goal is gonna be to prepare the quantum state X, the solution of the linear system. And we are gonna use a, a variational answer similar to this one here, where the classical parameters that we are gonna optimize are the angles of these rotations. This is very standard in variational quantum algorithm. What is not so standard is that, as we will see later, but let me mention it now, we have a, a certification criteria so that when we read the value of the cost function, we know we have an upper bound of the error of the algorithm. Okay, By simply reading the value of the cost function, being the error some measure of distance between the exact solution and the solution that outputs the variational quantum linear solver. I will enter into this details in the following slides. And finally, the output, you have trained the, the, the variational quantum linear solver. You simply output the optimal parameters once you, once you read this stopping criteria, and you can prepare the, the solution of the linear system by simply implementing these optimal parameters in your answer, right? Then you will have the quantum state X, which is proportional to the classical solution X, but normalized. So cost functions are probably the most important parts of variational quantum algorithms because they encode the problem that you are trying to solve. 
In the paper, we define several cost functions, but let me uh, present, present you two of them. The first one is the global cost function, which is defined in terms of global operators. And as you can see, it basically quantizes the overlap of A acting on, on X and B, right? This is something that you would like to maximize. Uh, although this cost function is very intuitive, as we will see the next slide, uh, it will lead to sustainability issues. Okay, so this is why we define another cost function that we have called the local cost function. Now we again um, uh, uh, check this orthogonality between x, a x, and the quantum state b, but now we do it locally, with by qubit. We can also show that there exists the following relation between the local and global cost function. And this basically means that if one of them is zero, the other one is zero as well. This would mean that we have solved uh, the linear system of equations. So both of them are faithful. Okay. So let me show you some results about trainability. Now, don't pay attention about the linear system that we are trying to solve. It doesn't matter. What I'm showing here is how both uh, cost functions evolve as we keep optimizing the parameters, as we, we keep uh, doing optimization steps. In red, you can see the global cost function, and in blue, you can see the local cost function. And to solve uh, problems up to 50 qubits, you can see that the local cost function is trained. You can decrease the number and the, the, the value of the cost function. However, for the global function, one we, we reach the qubit, the gradients are basically zero, and you cannot train the, the cost function. So this basically means that if you want to build a variational quantum algorithm, you better define a local cost function instead of a global cost function, because otherwise you may, you may have trainability issues. On the other hand, we also prove some solution guarantees, as I, will, I was mentioning previously. You can show that there exists this relation between the uh, global and local functions with the uh, properties of the linear system, in particular with the error epsilon and the condition number of the matrix A. Being, as I was saying, as I said, uh, the error epsilon is trace distance between the exact uh, solution and the solution that outputs the validation of quantum linear solver. This basically means now that you can upper bound the error epsilon by uh, uh, the condition number, the number of qubits, and the value of the cost function, being the gamma, the value that you read after the measurement of the cost function. And this, interestingly, can be used as a stopping criteria. So you can set a maximum error. And by simply setting this uh, maximum error, you know what's the value needed for the cost function so that you stop the variational quantum algorithm. Let me show you um, some uh, results. We try to simulate this uh, variational quantum linear solver. First, we implemented it for a, let's say, easy example. So our matrix A is going to be an easing like linear system. And the vector B is going to be the, the superposition of all the computational basis states. We are going to tune these parameters here such that the matrix A has some particular condition number that we can control. So these are the scalings, the heuristic scalings for the condition number and the error epsilon. The y-axis showing the two solution. This is something proportional to the number of iterations that we need to guarantee some precision epsilon. Here we do no cheating, so we don't know the precise error epsilon. We simply apply our uh, stopping criteria that I mentioned previously. And the x-axis, you can see how it depends on the condition number and one over epsilon the, being at the error for different number of qubits and for different fixed positions and condition numbers. And uh, you can see that uh, the, the solution depends linearly with the condition number, which is great, and also depends logarithmically with one over epsilon, which is actual, uh, actually is known to be optimal. 
On the other hand, we plot the distinctive solution versus the number of peaks for different uh, initial numbers and for a fixed uh, epsilon. We can see that the complexity scales linearly with the number of qubits, so logarithmically with the size of the matrix. And, and this is actually great, right? Because this would imply uh, some speed up versus some naive classical method. But this is not surprising because everything related to the 1D easing model typically can be uh, efficiently simulated with, with a classical computer, right? So we decided to go try a harder example. We now define our matrix A with random matrices, right? So we are gonna switch on and off this P. So this P is gonna have values zero or one. We're gonna randomize A among, uh, between values of minus one and one. And we are gonna choose randomly Pauli matrices here, body Pauli matrices. Our uh, the quantum state B is going to be again the superposition of all the computational basis states. And again, we are going to put these parameters such that A has some particular condition number kappa. So again, these are the results for the scaling with the condition number and epsilon for different errors epsilon and for these condition numbers. Um, and again, you can see that uh, the complexity for the condition number scales slightly sublinear or linear, and logarithmically, logarithmically with one over epsilon, which is again uh, good. On the other hand, for the uh, number of cubics, uh, this time is not linear with the number of cubics, but instead is polynomial with uh, an exponent of one, uh, 8.5. Still, this would mean that uh, the scaling is polylogarithmically polylogarithmic with the size of the matrix. So this would also represent a, an exponential speed up over na naive methods, at least for classically determining the linear system. Finally, let me show you some results about an implementation that we did in uh, on Rigetti's quantum computer. We took the easy example of the easing-like linear system, and we implemented that uh, qubit uh, linear system. So uh, 1,024 by 1,024 uh, matrix A. These are results for the uh, cost function training as a function of the number of iterations. And as you can see, uh, so we did two different runs that you can see in uh, red and green and also a simulation in black. As you can see, the results of the uh, real uh, executions are very close to the actual simulation. Not only that, we also observed uh, some kind of noise resilience. So uh, we observed that the, uh, the executions on the real quantum device, we obtained the correct parameters despite uh, the noise, which is actually great because now we could, for instance, apply error mitigation techniques to obtain uh, the correct quantum state X, for instance. So a uh, quick summary of this part, uh, uh, we developed a variational quantum algorithms, uh, algorithm for solving linear system of equations. We also show that uh, the best way to go is to uh, implement your algorithms with local cost functions. If you don't want to have trainability issues from the beginning by using uh, global cost functions. We also, uh, uh, defined a certification procedure that can be used as a stopping criteria, which is great. Uh, we did large scale heuristics, so in efficient scaling for both this uh, easing like uh, linear system and uh, with uh, for random matrices. And also we did large scale implementations on Rigetti's quantum hardware. If you are interested in this uh, variational quantum algorithm, you can also find two independent tutorials in uh, IBM uh, Kiskit and also in Xanadu's uh, Penny Lane, if you wanna play around. So finally, let me move to the last research project that is titled Style-Based Quantum Generative Adversarial Networks for Monte Carlo Events. And this was a joint work with uh, Julian Baglio, Marco C, Anthony Francis, uh, Dorota Grabowska, and Stefano Carrazzo, and was published recently in Quantum.
So let me give you a bit of motivation. Although I'm not an expert in, in high energy physics, I can certainly say that in the LHC, you can produce millions and, and millions of proton collisions per second. And this indeed is a huge complex environment, especially if you want to simulate this, this, this environment. Indeed, it requires lots of computing power. It's also uh, very time consuming. So what people did recently, they tried to approach this issue of event generation with machine learning. So the main idea of this is to train our neural network with a small data set and then use uh, machine learning techniques to learn this underlying distribution and generate for free, say for free, a much larger da data set. And this is actually what we are going to do in this project, but uh, we are going to use uh, generative other uh, networks. But what is a generative adversarial network, right? So in this framework, you use two different networks that will compete, a generator and a discriminator. The idea, the main goal is that the generator will create fake data and the discriminator will try to distinguish whether the data is fake or real. At the end, you're gonna have an adversarial game where you are gonna input some latent variables into the generator so that this generator maps these latent variables to some underlying reference distribution to try to cheat to the discriminator, okay? So I like to do this analogy to make things uh, clearer. You can imagine that the generator is an art forger and the discriminator is a hard historian, right? The generator is gonna try to create uh, fake paintings that look like the authentic ones. And the discriminator is gonna check these paintings and try to catch the forgery. The training is gonna be a catch me if you can game between both the art forger and the art historian. And at the end of the training, the painted forgeries will be so good that the art historian will have at most a 50 guess percent uh, ratio. And this will mean that the art forger uh, will create new work that look like the authentic one. So what about the training procedure? As I was mentioning, the training will consist of on uh, adapting alternatively the generator, generator G, that will depend on some classical parameters, G, and the latent variable C, and the discriminator, that will depend as well on some set of classical parameters and the input data, whether it's real or fake, it doesn't matter. The mathematical tool that we are gonna use is the so-called uh, binary cross entropy, and indeed, since we have two different networks, we are gonna have two different loss functions. For the generator here, you can see this cost function as the uh, probability of the discriminator saying that the fake data is fake. So this is something that we would like to minimize. So we are gonna minimize this loss function. On the other hand, uh, for the discriminator, you can see this as the probability. You have two different terms. This one, you can see that the probability of the discriminator saying that the real data is real. So this is something that you would like to maximize. On the other hand, the probability of saying that the fake data is fake. Indeed, this is something that you would like to maximize. So at the end, this is like a min max player game where you would like to minimize the loss function of the generator and maximize the loss function of the discriminator. And uh, a cool thing about this is that when uh, um, you reach a convergence point, uh, both cost functions are gonna have the same value. You reach a Nash equilibrium, as we will see later as well. So everything I have explained up to now uh, can be attributed to the classical setup. What we do in this research project is basically we change uh, the classical generator for a quantum generator, okay? But specifically, we are gonna use a style-based quantum generator. This is the figure of the generator, the quantum generator that we are gonna use. It consists of different uh, rotations and some entangling gates that will depend on the specific problem. And it will contain different number of layers, this being one of the layers. 
So recall that the goal of the quantum generator is to create fake samples. So how are we going to create these fake samples? In our case, each of the qubits of our quantum uh, circuit will deliver one of the components of the fake vector. Being each of the components, the, the expectation value of the sigma C operator. So we are going to measure always in the computational basis and measure the expectation value. The, the C expectation value of each of the qubits. So why do we call this a file based? The main idea in, constant, in contrast to previous proposal is that we implement these latent variables on every uh, rotation of the quantum circuit, not only in the initial quantum state. And we are going to implement the latent variables in every rotation, as you can see here. So. Uh, 5G are going to be the classical parameters, and one of them is going to be multiplied by one of the components of the Latin vector. Okay. Uh, actually, you may notice that this is reminiscent of the real loading scheme. Okay. But you may ask, why, uh, why do I have to implement this style-based approach? Why is this useful? It has been seen, actually, that for univariate functions, repeatedly encoding uh, the data, so repeatedly including the latent variables, for instance, in our case, make uh, the network uh, a universal function approximator, right? So having networks of this type here, where you have uh, blocks of encoding data and blocks of uh, gates, at the end, uh, they try to approximate the function as a series where the frequencies will depend on these uh, blocks of encoding data. But at the end, this will be a universal approximate. And this is great. On the other hand, it also has been seen that data encoding only once restricts uh, the function that the can be And for multivariate functions, it also has been seen that two particular schemes of repetition blocks are also universal function approximators. So the intuition says that the way to go is to use this style-based approach for quantum generative adversarial networks. So finally, let me show you some results. First, uh, we wanted to validate the style QGAN uh, by simply implementing an easy example. In this case, the 1D gamma distribution. Since this is a 1D, distribution, we are going to only use one qubit with only one layer, so a shallow uh, quantum circuit, and we are going to discretize the distribution using 100 beams. We are going to train our quantum generator using 10,000 samples until we reach convergence, and then we are going to use the quantum generator to generate 10,000 samples and also 100 samples, right? So we are going to train the generator with a small data set, and then we are, are going to create a larger data set using our quantum generation to demonstrate uh, that augmentation. So the figure that you see here on the top uh, is the evolution of the loss function as we, as we increase the number of epochs. This is uh, how a well-trained uh, adversarial network should uh, look like. In the beginning, you have these like wheels. Both uh, functions vary a lot, the values, but then at the end, uh, both cost functions are going to have the same value. So we reached indeed uh, the Nash equilibrium. Uh, here at the bottom, showing different results of the style QGAN for particular examples like this, where we generate 10 to the thousand samples, and the case where we generate 100,000 samples. Here we are in the data augmentation regime. And as you can see, uh, in both cases, the KL divergence is actually pretty small. We have something very close to the underlying uh, gamma distribution, which is great. So after the validation, we move to a real example. In this case, we uh, tested the style QGAN 
with a real data coming from a proton-proton collision, proton-proton from uh, to T T bar. Okay, we are gonna again we are gonna train the quantum generator with ten thousand samples, uh, and in particular these are gonna be the Mandelstrom uh, uh, variables S and T and the rapidity Y. So we are gonna have three D distributions with three different variables. Since now we have uh, three D distributions, we are gonna use three qubits. Uh, two layers, and again, we are going to discretize our distributions with 100 bits. And here you can see the results for the 1D projections over the different variables, S, T, and Y, in the case of that augmentation. So I'm showing here the results for uh, 100,000 samples generated. Okay, so we are in the data augmentation regime. And again, you can see that the Real divergences are actually pretty small, very close to the real world, the underlying reference distribution. But now uh, we have a 3D distribution, so we can also uh, project in two dimensions and see whether we obtained also the correct correlations between the different dimensions. And indeed, we also observed that the quantum circuit managed to capture almost perfectly the correlations between the different dimensions, T, S, Y, T, and S, Y. So the correlations are well captured, but are these results maintained if we move to real quantum hardware? So this is actually what we did. We tried to implement the style QGAN on IBM quantum hardware, in particular on IBM Santiago, which is a five qubit machine with this particular architecture here. And these are, again, the results for the documentation case. Now you can see that the results in blue generated by the quantum generator do not look as good as previously in the simulations, but still the KL divergences are relatively small. So the results are uh, somehow decent. But the questions are, is, uh, did the noise destroy also the correlations between the different variables? As you can see, uh, Actually, uh, the answer is no. The results are not as good as in the simulations, but noise didn't completely destroy the correlations between the variables, which is uh, good. Finally, let me just uh, move to another implementation. We also implemented the style QGAN in uh, trapped ion technology on IonQ. The main goal of this is not to compare both quantum hardware, but instead to assess whether the style QGAN is, in some sense, hardware independent, right? Because now we have different type of connectivity, different uh, decoherence times, different uh, noise, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, uh, the problem was that we were constrained by the access to IonQ, and we could only uh, sample 1,000 times. Still, on the top, you have the results for the IonQ, and on the bottom, the results for IBM. And although now the, uh, the results are somehow sparser, you can st still see that both are similar and that the correlations are still uh, well captured. So we can see that uh, the style QGAN is, in some sense, hardware independent. Let me finalize with a quick summary about this. We presented uh, a novel quantum generator that we have called a style based quantum generator. We used this quantum generator to, to reproduce real Monte Carlo events, and it was proven a success, right? Because we managed to learn the underlying distributions ST and Y, and not only distributions, but also the correlations for the proton-proton TT bar. Uh, we also demonstrated that augmentation because we trained with 10,000 samples, our quantum generator, but then we asked for a much uh, larger data set with uh, 100,000 samples. Not only that, but the quantum networks are actually very shallow, which is of great advantage for NISC devices. And we tested this style QGAN in two different architectures, trapped ions and superconducting qubits. And we observed that the quantum generation is largely uh, hardware independent. So this is everything I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you very much. So there's questions here.
Is there any question from the audience? But I, I can ask you, meanwhile, the others decide to ask. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. In your slide, uh, well, where you compare trapped ion results with uh, in your slide 42, well, yes. Uh, yeah. Are you planning to have more samples to to have a comparison with the results that you get? Uh, not really, no? <laughs> mainly because we do not have uh, at this moment access to ion Q, unfortunately. Uh, and basically we were limited because of the funding. I mean, uh, running stuff on trapped ions is quite expensive, at least compared to superconducting devices. If you access them through Amazon Web Services, basically. <laughs> but no, not really. Okay, thank you. And, and is there uh, any reason why uh, you use data set from proton proton and not uh, any other like let let or mm. so with these mm. three variables, right? Yeah, not really, no, not anything in particular. I mean, uh, this was basically suggested by the co-authors who are the experts in high energy physics. I particularly didn't mind any particular uh, data set. Um, I'm not sure what would be the difference compared to other distribution. I mean, if you increase the dimension of the you increase the number of dimensions of the distribution, then you require larger quantum circuits, which would be great if you want to assess the style QGAN method. But we we actually didn't try it. Yeah. Thank you. Very amazing results. Okay. There are some other questions here in, in the audience. No? I have a question. I don't know if you can, hear, can you hear me? Maybe more or less. Can you because we are up? all together here in Sesga, we're in a huge room. So thank you for your talk. I have several questions, but I'm, I think that I'm going to focus a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give uh, more clues about the local cost function implementation? I'm going to check it in planning lane, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm interested. What do you mean specifically? in the linear solver. Uh -huh. uh, can you explain a little bit how you use it? Yeah, so so this is very intuitive, right? But you are basically here checking the orthogonality between B and uh, B acting on X, right? Here we do the same, but instead of putting the quantum state B, we do it qubit by qubit. So recall that B, one of the assumptions is that B created by this unitary U, uh -huh. right? So this is the U that appears here. Here now, are basically taking qubit by qubit, measuring each of them, and taking the orthogonality. Mm -hmm. Okay, separately. Separately, exactly. This is why we divide by one over n. And you can see that actually, this uh, the global cost function is going to be always in between the value of the uh, local cost function and n times the value of the local cost function because of, because of this n this of the local of the authority by qubit. Okay. Yeah. I have more questions. Um, in the quantum singular value decomposer section, mm -hmm. you mentioned a like the performance of long distance swap gates. Can you explain it a little bit more? Yeah, so this is a, a curious spin-off of the quantum singular value decomposer, but actually I don't know if this has any particular uh, application. The, is that, the idea is that after you train the quantum singular value decomposer, so we are here in the middle, you already have trained the quantum singular value decomposer, right? If you apply B dagger on this subsystem and U dagger on this subsystem, so you communicate the the classical parameters and the set of gates that you are applying, mm -hmm. right? You apply the inverted unitary. You can obtain a swap between the subsystems by simply classical communication. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm, 
am I being clear or, or should I simply communicate in the bits that you are implementing and the classical parameters, the optimal classical parameters, one you have trained, the quantum sequence by the composer, to achieve this form of the subsystem. Okay. Obviously, it would be easier to simply implement uh, quantum swaps between them, but this would mean that you need both subsystems to be close to each other, right? We have That's to. why we call this long distance swap. Because okay. by simply classical communication, you can implement this this one. Okay, and then the last one, <laughs> a, mm -hmm. in the generative adversarial net scheme, a, why are, why are you using that scheme for the generator? This one here. Yeah. I mean, it so what's left here behind? Yeah, it doesn't really matter which like particular scheme you use for the generator. Uh -huh. We use this one because we know that <clears throat> on single qubits with R, Y, and R, R set, times, this is a universal function approximator for a single qubit. Uh -huh. This is why we use this kind of architecture. And then we wanted to have also some entangling gates between the qubits because we knew that the variables have had different uh, had correlations among them, right? But and there's no, and yeah. the entanglement, how, how does it look like? The what? The entanglement that you... Uh, yeah, it depends on, on the problem. Uh, for the problems that I've shown you, uh, there are they are control uh, rotations. Two control rotations. So in the case where we use three qubits, uh -huh. there are, they are basically two rotations. One, two, uh, one uh, the first qubit being the target and the second one being the, co uh, the control. and and similar to the other two ones, so two, two, rota two, two control rotations, playing in a cascade fashion. So like linear, yeah, like linear. Uh, linear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so only two control rates. In the case of multivariable problems, you use like data re-uploading. Or is an idea? Uh, in both cases, we use uh, this data re-uploading. Okay. So we we so the the quant in every in the generator for an adversarial network, both classical and uh, quantum generator, you have to feed it with uh, Latin variables, right? And what we do is we feed these Latin variables on every gate of a quantum circuit, compared to previous proposals with where you only implement these Latin variables at the beginning of the circuit. What do you mean by Latin variable? Latin. Uh, this is uh, these are words typically used in generative modeling, but basically these Latin variables are is a noise distribution. So you sample from some yeah. Gaussian noise, for instance, and these are your Latin variables. Uh, what you explain that you are inserting noise in its gate is that you what that you are inserting noise in its gate of the model. Yeah. Basically, in our particular implementations, is is it's uh, Gaussian noise actually. Okay. Yeah. So, so at the end, the generator learns to map this Gaussian noise to a particular uh, underlying distribution that you are interested in. This is the whole goal of the generator. Okay. So I'm done. <laughs> thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Any questions? I think there is a question in the chat, Carlos. There's a question in the chat. Yeah, but, uh, maybe can ask Sergio. You can open your mic. Uh, wait. Uh, hi. Hi. Can you hi. hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot, Carlos, for your amazing talk. It it was very, very, very interesting. So I just want to ask you. Uh, regarding the variational circuit you mm -hmm. you, you mentioned and um, have you planned to use some uh, optimization algorithms for uh, the data augmentation or or for the the full overall on the, the full outcome of the circuit mm, I'm not sure if I understood your question um, so in Every variational quantum algorithm, you have to optimize so, somehow the classical parameters, right? In the examples that I have shown you 
in all the three research projects, we used a gradient based uh, optimizer. But uh, in practice, you could use you could use also a gradient free uh, optimizer. But uh, can you repeat the question? Because I'm not sure if I understood it. Yes, um, I mean about what you said. Um, uh, in a way, if you have planned uh, another kind of optimizer like uh, mm -hmm. Rotosol for mm -hmm. or, or Rotoselect or some. Yeah. No. I guess it depends on the implementation. So for our simulations, since we simulate the full, the whole state vector, gradient based methods work really well. However, when you try to implement these variational quantum algorithms in real hardware, since you have noise and you have st statistical errors coming from the finite uh, sampling, their gradient methods do not work that well. And actually, uh, I remember that we have used some uh, uh, genetic algorithms, for instance, which are uh, gradient free. Yeah. But yeah, I'm particularly open to, to try uh, different optimizers. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. So I, I think um, since we have uh, this uh, other meeting mm -hmm. later, so uh, we can leave the other questions for this close meeting. So mm -hmm. we can end up now. So we thank very much, Carlos. Thank you. thank you, Carlos. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.